Good morning and welcome to First United Methodist Church of South Charleston, West Virginia. This is our online worship service for July the 12th. Welcome. Please join me now in the call to worship. God, let us count the ways you never leave us. Your light of day greeted us this morning. The smell of the crisp air of a new day. The melody of the birds whispered your love in our ears. These are among the good morning gifts we give thanks for. Another day in your precious presence. Come what may this day, angry traffic, angry words, paved or unpaved roads, we will praise your holy name. And so we greet you this day with shouts of joy and thanksgiving. Amen. Spirit of the living God, the light and fire divine, descend upon thy church once more and make it truly thine. Fill it with love and joy and power, with righteousness and peace, till Christ shall dwell in human hearts and sin and sorrow cease. Teach us to utter living words of truth which all may hear. The language all may understand when law speaks loud and Shall blend their creeds in one, and her shall form one family for whom thy will is done. So shall we know the power of Christ who came this world to save. So shall we rise with him to life which soars beyond the grave. And earth shall win true holiness which makes thy children whole till perfect and by thee we reach creation's glorious goal. Good morning. Have you ever done something bad and you were punished by being told to sit in a chair? Have you ever been placed in a timeout chair? Have you done something wrong that either a parent or an older adult told you to sit out by yourself for what seemed like a lifetime and think about what you did? Well, I can remember when I was a little girl that my mom would tell me and my brother to sit in a timeout chair. My mom tried to have me sit in the timeout chair as well. It was hard for me to sit still because I was thinking about all the other things I could be doing, such as riding my bike or playing outside, playing ball, or just watching TV. The timeout chair was punishment to show that there are consequences for our actions. When we made bad choices or bad decisions, there are consequences. The result of bad choices was the timeout chair. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, reminds us that when we follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit should control the way we live. The Holy Spirit sets us free from sin and should guide us in the choices we make. When we become followers of Jesus, our lives and how we make decisions should change. Life is all about living like God wants us to live. Every decision should be influenced by the Holy Spirit. Do you remember how you felt when you were told that you could get up and leave the timeout chair? When we let the Spirit of Jesus live in us, it's like we're being released from a timeout. 
We are free to love one another, worship God, and enjoy the life that's been given to us. As we go about our day thinking of actions that are pleasing to God, we make better choices. Let's bow our heads. O oh Lord our God, lover of the whole world, teach us to follow the Holy Spirit's movement as it directs our lives. Teach us to bless others in the way the Spirit controls our decision. While we do that, we will show actions that are more pleasing to you and one another. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 8 through 11. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit in life, Christ Jesus, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, through the bod though the body is dead because of sin... The Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through His Spirit that dwells in you. The Word of God for the people of God. Is your mind set? Here we are in the middle of summer, and this is usually the time that I start to wonder how I'm going to keep folks involved or how I'm going to get you reinvolved once fall rolls around, because many of you would have taken this time to head to the lake 
or visit with other folks or have vacation. But this year has been a little different. I've started worrying about how to keep you involved clear back in March. And we've tried in various ways to stay together, even if it is online. And now we're all wondering how we will relaunch or reactivate come fall when things are somewhat back to normal. We sort of ask questions in these ways, but even here in the cities, as well as in the wildernesses around us, God finds ways to involve us. Who will rescue me from this body of death? To preach Romans 8, you have to back up a few verses to see what question Paul is attempting to answer. You see, he ends chapter 7 with what sounds like, well, a personal outburst of his own sinfulness. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil that I do not want is what I do. I guess it's an old-fashioned way of saying the devil made me do it. But this final passage from chapter 7 is one that redeems Paul in the eyes of many people. To be brutally honest like this, to admit his own failings, to confess that he has been wrestling with sin in his own body and in his life, well, it makes him more human, more like us and we can sympathize. More than that, we can feel a little bit or maybe even a lot better about, well, some of our own inadequacies. If even Paul can struggle, we think that maybe our struggles aren't quite so bad. Except that isn't why Paul ended chapter seven that way. He wasn't going for solidarity with us poor sinners. He might not have even been talking about himself. Most of the letter to the Romans is written in a dialogical style where Paul takes on a dual persona to debate and argue and present his own ideas and his own defense. So this might have been a technique he was using to wrap up the first section of the epistle and to introduce the second section. But very seldom do we take that much time to dissect what he's saying. But Paul wasn't adverse to using his own life to make a point. He was very well aware of his own shortcomings and his failures in life. So why not allow him this moment of personal privilege or personal shame, maybe, to set up what it is that he intends to say? Phillips Brooks famously said that preaching is bringing truth through personality. So here is Paul trying to bring the truth through the personality of his own life. Except I don't know that it's about Paul. Or maybe it is about Paul, but not just Paul. Maybe it's about Paul as well, a representative of all of us. Maybe it's about the human condition, a human condition that is of ultimate helplessness to bring about our own salvation, or in Paul's words, to rescue us from a body of death. Now, thankfully, we don't have to rescue ourselves. We've been rescued already. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now there's a whole lot to unpack right there. And if we really dive into it, it's going to be a lot more than one sermon can handle. And chances are we'll refer to that many times during the course of the year. But before getting into all of that, let's pause for just a moment. Let's stand in the grace and the freedom that these verses share. Celebrate the gift. Taste a life that there is to offer here. Revel in it as Paul does before we try to understand it. 
We too many times try to define grace in ways of humanity, in ways that we would look at someone repaying or retribution or whatever else that we want to call it in order to get in good graces. But Paul constantly reminds us that we didn't do anything to earn the grace and we can't ever do anything to earn the grace. It is a thing of faith. Realize that it is countercultural, this faith thing. We nod when we hear these things, and I can picture many of you out there during sermons from time to time saying, Yes, thank you, Jesus, without really saying it out loud, of course. And you're grasping with the depth of the gift, the very radical nature of grace. You see, our culture is one that is a can-do culture. If it is to be, it's up to me. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Whatever cliche comes to mind for you, we have that kind of faith. To begin with the proclamation that there is something you can't do, well, that just about flies in the face of being an American. To admit that we are helpless in the face of our own sin is a shame and an embarrassment in the very climate of our culture. And it is the very thing that holds the church back in ways of inviting new people to come and join us because the typical response is, well, when I get my life together, I'll start coming to church or I can't go to church. I'm too much of a sinner. And we don't bother correcting people that, folks, we're all sinners. We're all here by the grace of God. Yes, if we skip over that, then Paul's argument is moot. To skip over this makes everything that follows empty and powerless. It's only in diving into the very depths of Paul's plea, will you rescue me? Folks, all around us are people saying, will you rescue me? It is only when we hear that cry and we start to realize the very glory of what Christ has done for us and in us, that we start to understand why the church exists. And what is that? How do we describe this gift, this no condemnation, or as the commercials for the various gyms that you see on TV, a non-judgment zone? Paul says, no condemnation, no judgment, freedom, freed from a law whose only purpose was to burden and to condemn. The freedom to live, I mean, really live and enjoy your purpose and know what the ultimate goal and outcome is going to be and to be able to live with that, to really live, that's a gift. It is, in fact, a life eternal. But that life begins now in the freedom of the grace of Jesus Christ, the resurrected one. And this Christ will give life to our mortal bodies. It means that we don't have to wait for heaven. We don't have to wait, meaning that this isn't just about someday. It's not about the future. It is about this day, right now. The very gift of eternal life has been given to us through the grace of God and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Does it have conditions? Well, yeah. But what doesn't? To live this life, 
to claim this freedom, there is an invitation to which we need to respond. Now hear that word, invitation. There is now no condemnation, writes Paul, for those who are in Christ. In Christ. Now, what was Paul meaning? What was in Christ to Paul? Well, as the scriptures were read this morning, Paul contrasts what it is to be in Christ as opposed to what it is to be in the flesh or in the spirit. Now, we, we have to be careful here. Flesh, flesh doesn't mean flesh. Now, I know, now I'm starting to get really confusing, which is not all that unusual for my sermons. It doesn't mean flesh. It means bodily things. Paul doesn't argue that bodies are bad or anything done in the body is to be avoided. Now, many have gone astray in these interpretations, and yes, they have stretched it to the limit in so many different ways. Yes, he lists the works of the flesh, and these are some bodily sins that are on that list, but there's also a couple spiritual sins on that list, like adultery. Now, Paul wouldn't argue that bodies are bad if he wants to argue that this gift of life comes to our mortal bodies. So why would he say that something is bad if God is going to bless it with a gift like that? Perhaps one way that we can translate this duality would to be to talk about self-directed and spirit-directed. Living guided only by self, selfishness and only thinking of ourselves, leads to death. And Paul argues that being guided by the Spirit is to know the very fullness of life. Living by the Spirit takes at the outside, Paul argues, a surrender of self. Ah, oh, that's where it starts to get fun we don't like not being in control. We don't like a situation where we don't call the shots. Paul argues that a surrender of self, it takes an admission that you are powerless in the face of your own sin. You ever wonder why we keep making the same mistakes over and over and over? We want to use our own decision-making. We want to use our faith. We want to use Jesus as an add-on, maybe a spiritual booster of some kind. It's something a little extra that will get us over that hump. We're almost to that world of salvation all on our own, and we just need to edge up over that bump. And that's where Jesus comes in. But, oh, you see, we are the bump. The very thing that needs to be moved out of the way for the Spirit to take up residence in us is the block that we put there. So that we can be Christ in ourselves, we need to realize that we can't move that bump all by ourselves, and it's not something that Jesus does as a last-second buzzer beater. We are submitted in Christ. It is not our will. It is Christ's will that needs to guide us. And I suppose the fear here on some people is that somehow we're going to be a little less of a person if we surrender to Christ. 
you know, the world, they look at us Christians and say they don't have any fun, they don't smile, they tell you you can't do everything. But the truth is the exact opposite of that. In the freedom of Christ, we become more of ourselves. This is what Paul meant when he said, in this spirit, we'll give life to our mortal bodies. We are more fully ourselves when we set our minds on the things of the spirit. When we set aside what this culture calls looking out for number one, we all know what that means. When we set that aside, we can truly become more alive. That's the invitation. Set your mind on Christ. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit, then you will live out the salvation that is ours in Jesus Christ every day, starting with today. Now, for many of you, you're in a prime example of giving your control over to Jesus. You see, I see some of your comments on Facebook and others, and there are a whole lot of those comments that aren't too loving, that are very judgmental and very narrow-minded. We're not thinking in the way of Christianity. We're reacting and not proacting. Your prayer is that God will help us to learn how to love in an unconditional way, regardless of the differences. Because the differences are far fewer than the commonalities. And when we learn that, we'll learn how full life can be. Because it takes every one of us in this world to make this planet survive. And we're surviving by God's grace. Keep that in mind the next time you start to make a comment on a picture or a statue or a flag. Amen. We continue to give thanks and praise to all of you that are actively continuing your support of the ministry of this church, even in the midst of the COVID-19 virus. Let us pray. God of the universe, we come to worship this morning, longing to set our minds on the Holy Spirit, to live with Christ within us. We have not always made room for Christ in the clutter of our lives. We have indulged our wants so often that too often the voice of the Spirit is drowned out. As we dedicate these gifts this morning, may it help us to live more in tune with the Spirit and to use our resources in a way that reflects Christ is Lord of all of our lives. In his holy name we pray, amen. And now I'd like to share, you, share with you the names of those who have been requested to keep in our prayers this week. Doug Mars, Shannon Spurlock, Rahima Perwez, Roy Fultner asks for continued prayers for his cousin, Gary. Also Nancy Miller, Aaron Coates, Megan Young, Karen Bumgardner, Steve Thomas, Sandy Warwick and Mike Warwick, Karen Johnston, Rod Allen Quinn, and Paul Smith. Let us pray. Lord, we confess that our lives, communities, public institutions, and cultural habits are desperately in need of repentance, transformation, healing, and renewal through your Holy Spirit. 
Where you desire love, there is hatred, suspicion, prejudice, and contempt. Where you intend joy, there is despair. Where you counsel patience, we are reactive and impulsive. Where you desire kindness, there is callousness. Where you ask us to respond to your goodness and to human need with generosity, we are too often selfish. Where you command faithfulness, we shy away from commitment and loyalty. Where you seek gentleness, we act with harshness. Where you counsel self-control, we express ourselves in hurtful and dangerous ways. We confess that we deserve from you the very things we have inflicted upon ourselves and one another. But for the sake of your crucified, risen, and ascended Son, who did not refuse the title friend of sinners, have mercy on us. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon all of us. Pour out his healing unction, wisdom, purity, and holy love. Pour your spirit upon everyone, black, white, brown, male, female, and those who aren't sure. Poor, wealthy, in between, progressives, conservatives, and independents, Christians, Jews, Muslims, other people of faith, and those who profess none, and upon every other sort and category of person we could imagine. We so desperately need the Spirit's gentle balm, like oil and wine, on our wounded hearts. With humble, hopeful hearts, with empty hands lifted in supplication, we plead, Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit, thrice holy, mighty, immortal God, come speedily, and turn not away from our plight. Enlighten our minds, purify our wills, cheer our heart, speed our feet, and strengthen our hands to serve our neighbors. Open our lips to declare your praise and to speak in word and deed, your word of law and gospel to people whose hearts are starved and whose lives cry out for you. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Amen. May you know that the love of God and the grace that comes through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit are with you in all of your actions, in all that you do and all that you witness. Go now with the peace of Christ. Amen. Till we meet again.